imagine with you today where we're going to live in 20 years, not how we're going to live or what it's going to look like or even what it's going to be made out of, but where we're going to live. I'm an architect, and architecture is a very old and stubborn discipline. It moves very slowly. It's stuck with gravity, human necessities, and desire. But with all of its slowness, and possibly because of it, it's had this function for the past 500 years of imagining the future. From the Renaissance ideal cities all the way to the 60s experiment, architects have always found it necessary to speculate on the future of human inhabitation and settlements. But this function of prescience, of foresight, has all but disappeared as architects carry a profound guilt for having made some of these possible futures terrible realities. We have helped deteriorate the planet with great enthusiasm and very little resistance. We created urban fabrics that made the political organization of our communities almost impossible. And we invented space where we erased the place of the body. But with all of this, there's never been a time where the necessity for foresight was more important. In 10,000 years, we have shifted the balance between the inert and the living. We have transformed that climate. Half of what was living is dead. We're living through the sixth great extinction in the history of this planet as we continue to populate it more and more and drain all of its resources. In a nutshell, we've created the age of man, our very own geological era. But if our nature is disappearing, then a new one must emerge. And architecture is precisely the relationship that humans build between the earth and the sky. This is how we organize nature. And if we are to survive as a species, we have to completely rethink our presence on this earth and reinvent a new way of inhabiting it. Our planet has an organization that is inherited from the Industrial Revolution. It's a series of nested territories that go from the countries that define borders to regions that hold our identities, cities that drive the economy, neighborhoods that organize our communities, streets that create public space, all the way to the house that is the sanctuary of the family. This organization has spread across the planet with very little modification and mutation. But precisely and paradoxically, maybe, it's the very global order that was created that is putting this structure in danger. It's a crisis of sovereignty, it's a crisis of identity, of the organization of our communities, in the management of public space, and it's also a crisis in the structure of our families. The only thing that seems to be resisting is the city. And the city is actually more than resisting, it's desirable. The city, with its uh, vitality, with its economic power, with its representative legitimacy, is actually taking over other levels of territorial organization. It's taking over regional dimension and even national dimension. In 1960, there were one billion people living in cities. Today, there are three and a half billion of us living in cities. In 20 years, in 2037, we will be six and a half billion citizens. That is the equivalent of building a city of three million people every week. Let me say this again. It's the equivalent of building Rome every week somewhere on the planet for the next 20 years. None of our urban territories are organized to face this kind of growth. We have to completely rethink what cities are, and we have to invent a new way of making them. Our contemporary city is built on this fantasy that it's limitless, that it has no borders. But this fantasy is somewhat recent, as cities have abandoned their limits less than 200 years ago. And it's been made possible, this urban growth, that we see everywhere on the planet by a powerful infrastructure, a series of reticulated network that feed our cities and that became, at the same time, hidden and not indigenous. These network that make our cities possible, that reticulate our cities, are organized on a state and suprastate level. We have networks that span thousands of kilometers for water, for gas, for electricity, for telecommunication, and for roads. These were always resources that humans were going to fight about. There were always struggles of powers around these resources. But now, it's reached a level 
where these globalized reticulated networks are a global geopolitical threat. And please, just imagine the recent history of the far Middle East as a reminder of this. They pose question of sovereignty, they pose question of equality, justice, and democracy. These networks that make our city possible have also become invisible. They're not part anymore of the territories we organize, unlike the aqueduct that was organizing the landscape, the basins of Marrakech that created one of the earlier versions and earlier presence of urban agriculture, the water tanks of Hampi in India that both organized an urban structure and the urban rituals, and closer to here, the wells of Venice, um, that in each and every campo, not only they dimensioned the size of the community, but it created the rituals for this community to care for this common resource. All of these examples, they show a balance between a resource, a territory, and a population. I want to share with you three projects that we've worked on, three meditations that pose these, these questions. A few years ago, we were asked to design a city in Morocco, 20 kilometers south of the capital city of Rabat. It's a site that's 3,500 hectares. It's huge. It's about half the size of Paris. But unlike continental Europe, when you go in developing countries, the territory is not reticulated. So we could only imagine having um, something like 5,000 people that could live in there. So instead of imposing a will, a dimension, a density to the site, we ask the site how many people it could have and we use water as a dimensioning tool. We imagine that by simply using a system of dams, very primitive, a system of reuse of gray water, very primitive, we could harvest a fair amount of water. We got to the number of 15 billion liters. That allowed us for building a city for 152,625 people, not one more. The way we did this, was simply create a series of dams in the depression of the topography that created the landscape, which we then had to protect with a greenway, a series of public park. We used the rest of the land that we subdivided in an agrarian way, in a rural structure that could be slowly colonized by villages and cities while keeping agriculture as the main economical vector of the area. By doing this, we invented a way of making a city that is finite dimension for a fixed number of people with a visible infrastructure. We didn't draw a city, we proposed a mode of colonization of the rural areas. It's a way of making new cities where people are. For this second project I'm gonna talk about, it started 10 years ago when these two guys met in Paris. Um, these two humanists in 2007, when they met, um, Gaddafi came to buy many things in France, uh, not always for good intention, but he also struck a deal with the French government that it would help him replan all the cities of Libya. The French government took care of Benghazi and Tripoli with the success that you know, and uh, we were asked to take care of all the cities of the Fezzan. The Fezzan is the southernmost region of Libya. It's about the size of Italy. It has 50 small cities, five medium-sized cities, and one capital that's called Seba. It's one of the most extraordinarily beautiful places I have ever seen. Extraordinarily complicated because it's at the border of the Darfur, it's the heart of the desert, but it sits on a humongous reserve of fresh water. The entire underground is a trapped lake that's been there for millions of years. It's a reserve of water that doesn't get recharged as it never rains, but there's so much water, in fact, that in the early 90s, Gaddafi decided to build a pipeline to bring water from the desert to the coast. Completely insane, of course. So we started working there, and we worked there for almost five years. And after two years, we were doing what we knew what to do best. We were doing nice drawings to make nice places for nice people, until we asked a basic question. How long could the 350,000 people that live in that entire region, how long could they continue to live where they live while using the water the way they're using it? And in the most optimistic projection, we knew it couldn't last more than 40 years. So we took all our work, threw it away, and we proposed a strategy that we didn't think would go down well, um, was to erase all of the smaller cities. 
all of the smaller villages, to consolidate the five larger ones, and to make a very large metropolis of the capital of Seba. It's only by reaching this density that we thought we could conserve the resource of water. I don't know if you can imagine how difficult it is to go tell people that they're going to have to leave the city that they've known, that their grandparents known, that they've been born in, that their kids have played in. There's something extraordinarily violent with this. And it was a great surprise to me to see the reaction, both of the population and the political representative, because they're all desert people. They know scarcity. They are strangely in tune with their environment. But urbanism as a discipline was created in the 19th century, or the turn of the 19th century and the 20th century, to organize the growth of cities, not to organize their obsolescence. So we had no tools to make them. We had, we had to invent our own toolbox to organize this disappearance of cities back to the desert. But then, going back to our office and looking at other situations, we realized that this doesn't only happen far away from us. The lack of any resource, the economical mutations, and even the climate change that we're seeing happening everywhere in the world is going to oblige us to find ways to give back cities to nature. The third project I'm going to talk about is slightly more speculative. We were asked to curate, two years ago, the Pavilion of Morocco at the Venice Biennale. It was supposed to celebrate 100 years of architectural achievement. And we chose to consider that Morocco's contribution was to have been a theater of experimentation. And it's true, for the better part of the 20th century, Morocco has been a land of experimentation and radical research in terms of architecture and urbanism. And in order to revive this, we invited several architects uh, to come down with us in the desert, in the Sahara, and to see how we could inhabit the uninhabitable. It was a way for me to propose a form of manifest destiny for the Sahara. The results of the work of all of these architects were extraordinary. Some people went toward much more essential elements, other more poetic, other more technological, and when we were faced with this question, we asked the following problem. How do you live in a place during the day when it's extremely hot? And how do you live in a place at night when it's much cooler? So we decided to propose a city below, where you live at night, and that is carved in the sand, and a city above, where we live during the day. So by taking this simple decision, things are usually next to each other, all of a sudden happen to be on top of each other, and it creates a relationship to space, to the shared community, to the views of the elements between one neighbor and to the next, and it invented this void that became the common public space for everybody. We consider, with these three projects, that we have invented a way of making new cities in places where there were none, and that were only dimensioned with what the land could offer. We consider that we have proposed a way of erasing cities where they shouldn't happen anymore uh, because it's not desirable. But we also have to think about making new forms of cities in territories that are far remote and much more extreme. And as a conclusion, I would like to leave you with this simple thought that's been haunting me for months now. What if we started to believe in what we know. We know we're running out of time. We have not yet chosen to believe in it. But when we all will start believing this, I am convinced that we will make fundamental and necessary change to welcome a desirable future. Thank you. <laughs>